Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so another presentation about DNS. Uh, and uh, thanks, John. Um, we will also, just like John, at the end talk about DDoS a little bit. Um, for us, that has a much more important role than for Quad9 um, because in, in contrast to Quad9, we do a lot of things related to performance and security and not just DNS. Um, very quickly, if you look at my badge, it says Maxime. My name is actually Henry. Um, I've been with Cloudflare for a few years and I'm currently based in London after being in San Francisco for a while. Uh, helping the company launch new products. So whenever we bring something out, like 1.1.1 or now Magic Transit, and I'll explain what that means in a moment, I'll help make it successful, whatever that means. Um, if you want to get in touch, feel free to send me an email. It's just hh at. It's very simple. Um, yeah, so before I actually talk about what we're doing with regards to DNS or DDoS, um, if you have never heard of Cloudflare before, this is sort of the one slide that's kind of the one you should not forget. And it's actually ironically quite similar to uh, what John showed with Quad9, uh, which shows you know that either one of us is onto something here. Um, so we have a pretty large globally distributed network. Um, we are also in Belgrade um, with, with SOX uh, as well. So it's really important to us to be as globally distributed as possible. And um, one important thing is that each of these locations, uh, each of these cities that you see here, um, the data centers that we have there fulfill more than just one function. So it's not like we have a DDoS data center or a DNS resolving data center. They all do exactly the same thing. Um, and we'll see why that's important in a moment. Um, so let's start with the DNS portion. So we also have a DNS resolver, right? And uh, like Google and like Quad9, uh, we like easy numbers. Um, so we got 1.1.1, which is, which is great because it's very easy to remember. But it's also a problem um, for reasons that we'll go through in a moment. Uh, but yeah, our main focus when we built this was privacy. And uh, right now, today, just a few numbers, it's currently doing about 150 billion uh, queries per day. Um, and the graph you see here is actually from when we launched it. So basically, we launched it on um, the 1st of April 2018, so about a year and a half ago, and immediately had a lot of people using it. Um, but we also had a lot of noise, and we'll see why that's interesting in a bit, because the reason that this IP address 1.1.1 um, wasn't in use before is not because it doesn't exist or because it's un unallocated or unassigned, but simply because the people that owned it, APNIC, chose not to do anything with it because they couldn't really, right? There was so much bogus traffic coming in, they couldn't really do anything. So they basically agreed with us at Cloudflare that they would give us access to this IP space in exchange for some joint research programs which they couldn't run because they literally just were not able to use it. And again, that's why this large network that I showed you is really important. Without it, this would effectively not be possible for us, right? Uh, so for, for someone like Quad9, it might be possible to do this today, but if you're just starting from scratch, right, like if you're an ISP somewhere, then this is not gonna work. Um, but yeah, as you can see, uh, our sort of goals were speed, privacy, and research. Um, so we'll start with the research aspect. Um, you might be wondering, why would anyone wanna use 1.1.1 Right, it's a DNS resolver now, like, you know, this is like, what, what, what else would you do with it? Well, it turns out a surprisingly large number of people for years have been telling other people that they should use this because apparently it's uh, fictitious and unassigned, right? That is, like, neither of those statements are true. It's very real, and it's definitely not unassigned. It was simply private, right? There's a, there's a big difference between the two. Um, so this is, uh, I think this is the CCNA documentation, right, which is like the Bible for network admins. Even they said use 1.1.1 for testing purposes. What could go wrong, right? Nothing. Um, there's lots of other people doing that, like no, no need to shame on anyone. And just ask yourself, uh, I'll give the answer in a bit, how much noise do you think we get, right? We'll come back to that question in a moment. Um, but yeah, basically, these are some examples. I know it's quite small, but the day we launched, we noticed how much pollution that IP space really gets, right? And actually, all of the names on the left um, are the good ones, right? So these are all the providers we came across who were not actually doing this properly, right? They had some misconfiguration, misconfigura um, but due to a lot of user reports, I think John mentioned something like that earlier, um, and the hard work of those providers themselves, we got in touch with them, they cleaned it, it's all good, right? No problem. 
uh, you guys all did great. Um, don't want to go into details why this was the case before, right? No, one, no one's fault, but it's fixed now. Um, there's even an example here uh, with Sonatel, that's the one I highlighted, um, where they blocked, um, or where they were using 1.1.0 slash 8, um, but not 1.0 um, and so forth. So actually our secondary address, 1.001, was working fine, but 1.1.1.1 wasn't. Users reported it, we got in touch, and as you can see from one day to another, the black line was 1.001 and the orange one was 1.1.1.1. From one day to another, it started working, which is great. Um, but it gets worse. It's not just the uh, backbones that were doing this, that were polluting the space, but it's also CPEs, right? Like consumer routers you would have at home that were sending strange signals, or even I think some printers that were using 111 for reasons that we don't know. Um, so with the help of RIPE, uh, we actually did some kind of um, expedition to hunt all of these devices down. It's a never ending search, but I think. We've done a pretty good job over the last year and a bit. Um, there's actually a really good blog post on our website uh, on how we use a lot of ripe probes to, to find all of these devices um, step by step. Um, but yeah, the answer to your question is about 10 gigs per second of noise. And about 10% at the beginning at least, this has changed over time. Um, so the slide is about a year old. So about a year ago, um, it was around 10% was legitimate traffic, right? So that's, that's not a lot, um, which is why Apnic didn't do anything with this IP space before, because it would have literally just burned their service down, right? Um, and you see most of the traffic we get is, is HTTP traffic, um, not DNS, as it should be. Um, but yeah, let's go to the privacy aspect, which is a lot more interesting. The reason why we built this was not to like sort of, I mean, one of the reasons we built it is because we could, like we were able to do it, which is great. Um, but the other reason was that we said, um, and that was discussed earlier by, by both John and David, um, that there's a bit of a privacy issue with DNS. Um, so a lot of that's already been said, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. But we basically set out to implement a lot of things that we thought would make the internet better, right? That's sort of our mission as a company, is to help build a better internet. And we wanted to implement all of these things. Um, so one thing that uh, John just talked about was the ECS, um, ECS situation, right? We don't want to leak that into the world. Um, there's some other things that I'll go into in a moment. Um, but sort of the most important thing is what you see here on the right, which is we will not store any of your information, right? So similar as Quad9, we're not storing any IPs ever, right? We just don't. Uh, no one can access them. We do store a few data points, but not client IPs or anything like that, um, which will then be aggregated and shared with APNIC. All of these logs are also deleted within 24 hours. So if for some reason the US government, and we are a US-based company, right, full transparency, decides to invade our servers because they saw something that they don't like, they would have to do it literally within 24 hours, and even then they basically don't get a lot. Um, so yeah, we. We're really, really strict on this policy. There's no one who has access to anything effectively. Um, but yeah, let's talk about a few things that we're doing specifically to improve privacy. Uh, one thing we're doing quite aggressively is DNS query minimization, because effectively the qualified name that typical resolvers send out is pretty long, right? And if you go to the root resolver or the .com resolver, they don't actually have to know half of the information that you want, right? They just have to know the next little bit that's relevant to the respective query. So we are basically taking the query apart and only asking the next question, so to speak, and then taking that answer to go to the next resolver and so forth, right? That's the whole point of being recursive, but instead of giving everyone everything, we only give them what they need to know. Then the other thing, um, and I know it's been talked about extensively, we've partnered with Firefox for uh, DOH implementation. I hope everyone now knows what DOH is. Uh, thanks, David. And uh, there's been a lot of controversy around it, but I think the fact that it is a possibility to set it up and that you have the choice to do this in an easy way is pretty important. And we can debate around you know, positive and negatives around that, um, but I think that we are making it more accessible to users is, is, is a step in the right direction. Uh, another thing that I didn't actually put on the slide, I'm not sure why I forgot, but we also actually have a mobile app 
um, which allows to configure 1.1.1 at the press of a button, and it does work on iOS. So you can totally set up 1.1.1.1 if you think that we're trustworthy um, on, your, on your Apple devices. Um, so we're trying to make this whole thing more accessible uh, and more user-friendly. If you don't trust us, right, that's your choice. Like, I'm not going to try and convince you. But if you do trust us, then you can set this up quite easily. Um, the final part is speed, right? It's, it's quite important, so I put this little, uh, little table on the right. Um, Cloudflare is fundamentally, apart from being a security company, also a performance company. Um, and from the start, it's been really important for us to make it very fast. There's a couple of things that we're doing. I put up two of them here. One of them is very aggressive pre-filling. So we use things like the Alexa 1 million, Umbrella 1 million, and a few other databases to figure out what are the most popular websites in any given region. And then we aggressively cache those sites so that the first time, even if we haven't cached it, quote unquote, before a customer or user goes onto these sites, um, they will immediately get a response. The other thing we're doing is uh, backend multicasting. So we're sharing the cache effectively across our machines because as our network size grows, this becomes a real issue, right? Um, and then the other thing which may or may not be really obvious, um, but as I said earlier, all of these little dots do a lot of things, not just resolving DNS. For example, they're also authoritative DNS servers. We have about 20 million websites running on Cloudflare and almost all of them use Cloudflare as an authoritative provider, meaning these are the servers that actually hold the answer to your DNS questions. So if the recursive, like if the person asking the question and the person asking, giving the answer are in the same room, obviously everything happens a lot faster. So the more customers we have with websites on our site, the faster we will be able to resolve that for everyone using 1.1.1. So it kind of benefits both sides, right? We get more people using the resolver. That's great for people with the website. We get people, more people using the websites. It's great for people using the resolver. Um, and then obviously, similar as with Quad9, right, the more locations we have around the world, the better. right? We can answer things faster. Ooh, there we go. So in summary, really easy IP. That's great. Uh, we're focusing a lot on privacy. We had you know, some issues. With, uh, with old devices polluting the space. And uh, it's quite fast. And finally, we think this is sort of one further step in the right direction of improving how the internet works. But uh, unlike Quad9, uh, sorry, I, I keep referencing you, but uh, you know, there are a lot of similarities. But this is where things kind of go apart. We're not a charity, right? We're not doing things for free. Although this particular service is free, um, at the end of the day, we have to make money somehow, right? Because we're certainly not getting free money from PCH or IBM and so forth. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're selling our network for DDoS mitigation. And that's sort of the next topic that I'm kind of squeezing uh, into this one talk here. Um, whoops, skip the slide. So we have a product called Magic Transit, which is pretty new. Um, personally, you know, the name is a little confusing, but it's going to make a lot of sense, right? Uh, in a moment. What we're effectively doing with this is we're providing DDoS mitigation for data centers. So someone running an ISP, for example, I, I have a feeling there's one or two people in the room doing that, um, could benefit from this by protecting the entire network and not just proxying HTTP applications. So in the past, um, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit salesy, but I'll make it very short. Um, in the past, you know, if you wanted to protect your network stack, your on-premise equipment from DDoS attacks, you would have to buy a lot of these really expensive appliances, right? It's a huge upfront cost. They're very specific point solutions. If you have a specific problem, right, you get a specific appliance, you get a specific machine. Um, and after a couple of years, they are basically outdated and you have to get new ones, right? So it's, it's not great. And, you know, we have this great buzzword, digital transformation, right? Stuff is moving from being on-premise into the cloud. And in this case, like, it's not just, you know, a buzzword. We're not just using this metaphorically, but that's actually what we want to do, right? We want to have this transition where we take things that are typically inside a data center, hardware things, and instead use virtual network functions to accomplish exactly the same thing. That's sort of the, the whole idea. Um, how are we doing this? Basically, again, this map sort of keeps coming up, but basically, we have this huge network, right? We have a resolver, we have a CDN, we have a web application firewall, all of this stuff. 
But if someone attacks Cloudflare's network and brings Cloudflare down, our resolver is offline, right? No one can use 11111. That would suck, right? Everyone using this for their DNS would be stranded or maybe has to rely on their backup. So we have to figure out a way to protect our own network. And we basically had a choice at one point to buy these, these appliances, right? There's lots of vendors selling these appliances. We thought about buying them ourselves, putting them into our own stack, into our data centers, you know, securing us this way. But we figured actually it would be a lot smarter if we just use commodity hardware and our own software stack to basically build this solution from scratch, um, which is exactly what we did. And that's effectively now what we're offering everyone who's interested, right? So we're offering the power of Cloudflare's entire network, right about, I think, 194, 200-ish uh, scrubbing centers at the same time, which can protect whatever we put behind it. That's sort of the whole premise. Um, might still sound a little ominous, but we'll get through it. What we're doing is kind of something that you might already have seen if you're familiar with DDoS protection. And I know after this, we have a lot of ISPs and, and telcos talking about this in more detail. So you probably know exactly what I'm talking about here. We would announce you know, the customer's IP space via BGP. So now all the traffic is going through us. And then inside this orange cloud, we would do, you know, someone described it as a washing machine, right? We wash the traffic, we scrub it, take out all the dirt, take out all the attack traffic, um, and then we forward all of the clean traffic. And this is where it gets interesting uh, because GRE tunnels are, you know, pretty old, right? It's not a new concept at all. But what's interesting is we're doing GRE tunnels via any cast. So that means we don't actually have, you know, one point to connecting another point, right, where we connect to a scrubbing data center and then that scrubbing data center connects to the final destination. But in fact, we have 200 scrubbing centers at the same time. And the way that works is effectively like this. We found out that GRE is not, is stateless, right? So it doesn't actually matter that we have different devices or machines, it's just connecting IP addresses. And the, pro the packets that are sent from an IP to another IP uh, just being set, sent independently. So it's completely irrelevant that we have 200 separate locations, right? They're just sending packets and it doesn't matter, you know, if we call it a tunnel, it's more like a conduit or something like that, right? We just send things um, and it's definitely not point to point. So this way um, we can constantly announce your traffic around the world and keep forwarding all of the traffic to your, to your destination. Uh, without slowing the traffic down in any way, because again, we have 200 data centers, so we're pretty close to wherever the eyeball, wherever the click is coming from. And what actually happens inside uh, is quite interesting. It's a little bit small, but you know, we'll go through it maybe very quickly. Um, basically, you know, some vendors say they have zero time to mitigate, right? That's sort of our first step. Um, basically, that's where you know, normal rules kick in. If you block an IP, Right, if that IP sends a packet, we can just block it. Takes no time, basically. Very simple. Then we have our edge routers, which do some basic mitigation. Um, you know, that takes about 10 seconds. Um, so if you have a lot of traffic, um, and it is possible to have false positives here. I've got some negative feedback yesterday, but we're obviously trying to reduce them as much as we can. But this is sort of, you know, where most of the work is happening. If we see an attack, that's usually where it gets stopped. At the same time, we're constantly sending NetFlow or SFlow data to a core data center um, where we apply some machine learning on the traffic flows that we see. Um, and if there's more complex attacks that we didn't immediately spot, we will send feedback to our edge routers. They will implement these new rules uh, and start blocking on those rules as well. So that process takes about one to five minutes, uh, depending on the complexity of the attack. And then finally, uh, far on the right, we have a SOC. So if you know, we completely fail at everything horrifically, which obviously never happens, um, then you can give the SOC a call and they will manually take a look at the traffic and mitigate it. So that's sort of very briefly how Cloudflare DDoS mitigation works on the inside. Um, an example, uh, Wikipedia a few months was attacked by, uh, by a DDoS attack. And we did something that we have never done and we don't really intend to repeat. Uh, we did an under attack onboarding while they were still being attacked. We onboarded their prefixes within a few hours and starting, started announcing the entirety of their traffic globally. Um, so you can see here, we announced a slightly more specific route to their IP addresses and inserted our AS effectively in front of theirs, meaning the traffic would now hit us 
uh, where we could perform the scrubbing, as, as explained before, um, and then send all of the clean traffic to Wikipedia via these Anycast JE tunnels. Um, and again, talking about the Anycast JE tunnels, the really interesting thing here, and that's, just, that's why we call it magic transit, um, is that it basically doesn't affect latency at all, right? So three milliseconds for an always on scrubbing solution is, is pretty low. And this is actually a global average. So in Europe and North America, it's close to zero. Um, so yeah, in the middle, by the way, you see the, the spikes that was when the attack happened, right? So obviously the latency went way up, uh, which is, I guess, why, why they gave us a call. So yeah, in summary, um, you know, we, c we can do this JRE over any cast solution, which is pretty cool because it means that we no longer have to slow traffic down uh, in order to protect it, right? So that's kind of our core mission is to provide security without degrading performance. Um, then overall, we're trying to achieve this paradigm shift, which is to move away from sort of a CapEx model where you pay a lot of money up front to a model where you can just pay as you go, right, OPEX, um, and you reduce your total cost of ownership of the whole situation. And then finally, because we do not just offer these layer three network type protections, but also layer four and layer seven uh, application specific things, we can actually just tack these on on top of what you have in your network, start, you know, for example, proxying your HTTP applications, offering some further firewall services on top of that at the click of a button, right? We can deploy these network functions without much effort. So that's sort of that, again, if you have any questions around this, if you want to learn more, feel free to get in touch. And otherwise, I think we're going to have a round table now, talk more about DNS, and then I think after that, more about DDoS. So this is great. <laughs>